You are listening to the Final Say Radio Show, a Rappaport Media production, with your host Brett Rappaport and co-host John Rappaport. Without further ado, we have our next guest on the line. Ethan Epstein is with the Weekly Standard, and uh, Ethan, it's a pleasure to have you on. You're on with uh, I'm Brett Rappaport and my co-host John Rappaport. Welcome to the Final Say Radio Show. Thanks so much. Uh, good afternoon. Great. Well, uh, let's first say, uh, unfortunately, we're watching the news this morning and and seeing a commercial airliner, a Malaysian uh, air, airliner, which is hard to believe after what we've seen what, with the Malaysian airliner earlier this year that disappeared, that airline and, and the people uh, having to deal with this once again, the loss of life, 295 people. But unfortunately, this happened over eastern Ukraine, close to the Russian border, and that's why we're discussing this particular region, this, this incident with you, because there are so many things here, uh, moving parts. It's a fluid story, and, of course, so many more facts for us to find out. But, uh, Ethan, if you can, uh, you know, in the, in the recent time, have, have you seen any uh, additional updates on some of the possible causes or any um, of the comments that are coming out of the various parties? Um yeah like like you said this is all this is all like truly late breaking news this has only happened in the last few hours um and you know i I hate to be boring, but I'm gonna try to be a responsible journalist here and not to sort of uh speculate too wildly but you know the yes. latest we've seen <laughs> yeah i i know you know doesn't doesn't make for the sexiest uh, journalism always but uh that's that's what we try to do here um of course, as you said, we know, we do know for sure that everybody on the plane was killed, 295 people. There have been unconfirmed reports that that included 80 children, which is just, you know, shocking and appalling. And potentially, oh, okay. m- yeah, potentially uh, 23 Americans as well. Um, obviously, we mourn the loss of everybody, but th- there are certainly, you know, geopolitical implications for us in particular if these Americans were killed in, in what does appear to be a massacre, in a sense, or even an act of war. Yeah, I, I hadn't seen any numbers on the possibility of Americans. I knew that was coming. Uh, and they were so focused on some of the other issues immediately, and I'm sure we're going to start to find out the information, the, the real, uh, honestly, the important information as to who was on the plane, what countries they were from, the types yeah. of peoples, the stories of these lives, as we see in all these stories. And, well, Ethan, I want to thank you, one, for we need more responsible journalists. And, of course, what, what, what we are trying to do here is we're not trying to assume anything. We think everything is on the table. We don't know. I mean, for, at the end of the day, it could be a, something that went wrong with the airplane. You, you don't know. But okay, I, that's yeah. why I think falling. I think it's important that the international community speak to the three main factions, Ukrainians, the pro-Russian separatists, and Russia, and talk them into an international group coming in, doing a full investigation on the ground, and obtaining all the boxes, all the components, and being able to get to the bottom of this. Because I think for this to not escalate into something much greater, that's what's going to be required. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, one thing that's potentially stabilizing in the fact in the fact is you could you kind of have to assume that it was if this were like a deliberate missile that took down the plane it's likely that it was an accident that it was a malaysian uh, aircraft just a horrific piece of terrible luck because malaysia uh, as a nation is obviously not involved in the conflict between ukraine and ukrainian separatists and russia um so if this were just you know a, a horrific case of you know collateral damage that would be a terrible tragedy and a terrible case of negligence but it could at least you know perhaps not lead to a full-scale war between ukraine and russia john oh i'm sorry john uh <laughs> must be on mute anyway sorry about that Ethan. i have a question no, and something that I'm, I'm concerned about i was watching the flight pattern uh as the you know they draw the lines as they do the reporting yeah. on you know the various networks and I'm thinking to myself, and, in the, and I saw the, uh, an AP report of the, I think it was the FAA, FAA, that issued a warning not to fly over that area for That's American right, air, yeah. airlines. And so I'm wondering myself, especially with the knowledge, and, and you know, we've seen these stories covered enough that we know this, captains of the airlines have a certain amount of discretion to change course when they feel that their passengers and their plane are in jeopardy. And in this case, how could you not think they're in jeopardy knowing 
that just yesterday and over the recent days that Ukrainian planes have been shot down. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point, and uh, it's it's disturbing. You're right. Pilots actually do have a lot of discretion. Even before they take off, they have to okay the the planned flight route for that day. Um, and th- you know, this again, it's eerie that it's a Malaysia Airlines plane because, of course, we still don't know what happened to the other missing 777 uh, from several months ago. But there's a lot of speculation in that flight too that there's something fishy with the pilot. Now, I'm not suggesting that there was obviously I'm not suggesting there was foul play on the part of the pilot or anything, but it certainly raises questions about the the competence of the airline and the people that fly its planes. Because you're right, they they do have discretion, and it, it would be madness clearly to fly over eastern Ukraine at, at this time. Yeah, you, just Ethan, a real, I'm, I'm sorry, John. Just a real quick comment. Uh, something I remember from reading a story about a South Korean airliner. It could be a mm-hmm. cultural thing. So some some, yes. some other culturals. Uh, I'm sorry. Some other cultures are so used to uh, more rigid um, instructions where yep. they're afraid to change from the pattern where, you know, as Americans, we question everything. They don't do that in some other places. And it could possibly just be a, a cultural issue that has to be addressed within these a- different airlines. Sorry, that's, a, that's another excellent point. Uh, you, know, you know, actually, after one of those Korean air crashes, I think it was one in Guam where the co-pilot was afraid to contradict the captain and therefore the plane crashed, uh, the airlines actually brought in Western trainers to sort of, um, you know, grind out that that uh, ingrained cultural tradition in the people, so that they learned to question authority and to always say what they thought. And some Asian airlines actually require that the two pilots be of different nationalities. So they'll pair up an Australian with a Chinese pilot, so they won't have those kind of uh, cultural problems that can lead to lead to these terrible occurrences. You know, that's fascinating. I fly internationally on a fairly regular basis. I've been to yep. Asia about seven, maybe eight times. I'll be there again probably twice before the end of the year. And I I never knew that, but I am absolutely aware of the cultural differences because if you do business in Asia, if you've ever sat at a board uh, meeting in Asia, <laughs> it takes you about, and I say Asia in a very generic sense because you yep. know, I've, I've experienced the same Slightly different cultural nuances, but very similar across uh, the uh, well in China, in Taiwan, in Korea, in Japan, etc. But, but anyway, it, it is uh, fascinating to think of. I, I feel, in some ways, I feel bad for the airline, and in other ways, as to what you pointed out, Ethan, I it would give me caution. I can't imagine you'd want to fly this airline, given the fact that at minimum, you have to judge their their business competency um, and. You know, bad luck sometimes comes in threes, so even if you're a superstitious person, you have to scratch your head and say, mm, maybe, I want, maybe I want to fly another one. But the fact that they happen over two such diverse and different circumstances, it's hard to imagine that the, the, the similar nefarious forces, if we assume the first one was not some kind of a, a uh, malfunction, uh, are at, uh, at play here. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to agree. Uh, like you, I've traveled a lot in Asia, and I've flown, you know, uh, Asian airlines. And well, you know, what the other thing about Malaysia Airlines is, if you think about it, I mean, air travel is so amazingly safe now. Planes crash so seldom that it's really strange that two of the same airline crash within such a short period. That's that really underlines that. Yeah, you're right. There's something strange going on here. Now, here's something I will add, though, is. We, it's way too early, and I appreciate I, it, what you pointed out about the concern of trying to play uh, too much, you know, guess, guess your journalism, because we really don't know. What I think is very important to point out here, though, is we are very rapidly trending in America. Uh, we we had the uh, um, Rand Paul right now, but his father, of course, Ron Paul. They're really sort of pushing back to the isolationist policies. And I always raise a caution flag because I'm from the mindset that you don't get to decide whether or not you want to participate in a war any more than you do a rape or anything else that bad happens in life. People or countries or businesses who are determined to somehow perpetrate something negative upon you, you're going to be the recipient of it whether you like it or not. You have to be aware and alert. And so if nothing else, this should be a wake-up call to all these uh, business people and other folks around the world that all of these things, they no longer occur in little vacuums. They're not little pockets of problems that you can totally avoid. 
and that you may find something as simple as taking your children on a vacation from Europe to Malaysia, a uh, war occurring in a far off land could be the end of your life or the end of uh, you know, the, the end of your business. And I think people need to start thinking more and more about the, uh, the politics and policy and things that are happening in the geopolitical stage because we, we either pay attention to what's going on or we just wait until we become victims and then hope that we could respond uh, in, in some way. Right now, I think we're making the big mistake both people not paying attention and government not, uh, not doing enough about preventing these things from happening in the first place. I, I agree. You know, it reminds me of the classic line, uh, you, may, you may not be interested in politics, but politics is interested in you. I mean, I think the same thing goes for international affairs. The the Rand and Ron Paul strain makes it sound easy. You know, just just close your eyes and pretend it doesn't exist. Well, that's that's not the way things work in the real world, unfortunately. Yeah, Ethan, I have uh, something I'm just seeing come across the uh, AP wire, it looks like. I'm sorry, I'm looking at my phone. Uh, Ukrainian rebels intend to call for a three-day ceasefire to allow plane crash probe. So they must be listening to, listening to us right now. <laughs> but uh, hope. Right. hope Hopefully that's accurate and that is the case. And uh, I suspect, honestly, that this was, I, it may have been an intended rocket launch, but I, I find it hard to imagine that anyone thought it was in the best interest to take down a commercial airliner. I think it was Agreed. just a, a hor horrific mistake. And maybe this is the thing that allows us as a community to, one, investigate this, and two, try to resolve the issues that are unfolding in Ukraine. Uh, I, I I agree on both counts. Yes. And uh, now, Ethan, um, just if we could step back a little bit, I just have a few questions. I know you've cover, you, you cover a lot of these issues for you know a long time now, but I, I just want to look at some of the things that get reported, such as uh, you know on the, on the pro-Russian separatist side. There's a lot of reporting that weapons or possible uh, un, unmarked or, or ununiformed uh, Russian soldiers have been crossing the border and participating in some of the uh, fighting that's been occurring. And on the, on the other hand, you see a lot of Russian media uh, reporting some of the horrific things that are being done by you know extreme fascists or whatnot. Uh, are, is there anything that you could provide to some of the truth or or facts on the ground that support some of those claims? You know, it's a it's a really hard one because, uh, as you say, there's there's a lot of confusion about what is actually going on. It seems like there's there's definitely incontrovertible proof that Russia is involved to a certain extent in su at least supplying weapons, perhaps, and maybe men and other supplies to at least you know a certain extent to the separatists in eastern Ukraine. I think a problem that Americans or a mistake that Americans make, though, is in assuming that there's no actual separatist sentiment in eastern Ukraine and that it's entirely like a Russian fiction and it's all Russia trying to destabilize things. I do think Russia has been destabilizing the situation, but I also think there is a significant population in eastern Ukraine that feels its interests are more aligned uh, with Russia than they are with the western half of Ukraine, which is you know, speaking a different language and is more inclined towards uh, Brussels than it is towards Moscow. Um, so I think uh, it, at our peril do we underestimate that that's like a legitimate sentiment that we may have to come to an accord with. And, you know, you want to talk about, as we are speaking, I'm now seeing an AP alert at 348. The Israeli military says it has launched a ground operation into the Gaza Strip. So, Ethan, wow. you want to talk about a busy news cycle. We are right yeah. in the middle of it. <laughs> Wait, I, I agree. wait a minute. I I'm going to say, yeah, wait, I got to step on you, Brett. I'm going to say this so Brett doesn't have to. Brett, at the start of the show, Ethan, Brett called that very same thing. He said, if the Israelis are smart, they will yeah. use this air, this event as air cover to launch the ground, the, uh, the ground right. invasion, because right. they, couldn't, they couldn't ask for a, a, tr a better timing for an otherwise awful tragedy to occur. Yeah, that's, that's I, an excellent point. Now, I, we don't have time to get into the whole co the Gaza thing right now, but I, I want to add this. Uh, my, my wife is actually, uh, she was born in St. Petersburg and uh, she, you know, uh, grew up in Latvia, so I know a lot of Russian-speaking people from a lot of the different countries. And so I, I hear things from both sides. But what I could say to this, 
And I think we have to look at it from a lot more perspectives than just an American eye. Ukraine is right next to Russia. It was part of the Soviet Union. It's not unheard of to think that the Russians would be lending some sort of support for trying to keep Ukraine in some sort of manner under their fold. And so I think it, it, you know, it, it is a problem, and that's why I think that at some point the, the big boys, the leaders, need to step back and sit at a table and try to work out these problems and, and come to something that all the parties could live with and, and you know, try to limit the bloodshed to what we've already witnessed. And, uh, it, well... Ethan, I don't know if you have a, a comment as far as that goes, but um, you no, know, I, I, think this, I yeah, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no I was going to say I'm, I'm sure that all of us is, you know, we try to sometimes be responsible journalists <laughs> on this program. But I, I think even you know all these stories, Ethan. We spend so much time watching all the conflicts around the world that you know we first of all, we don't want to see entire cities and neighborhoods being reduced to rubble. We don't want to see the losses of unnecessary civilian losses. We don't even want to see the loss of troops. I mean, we see it in our own country as our men and women return from Afghanistan and Iraq, the things that all these families have to deal with, you know, for those that survive and come back injured or those who just have dealt with the traumatic uh, impact of it. But at some point, the adults have to step up, is what I'm saying. Yep, I agree, and... You know, we have, there's not only the Rand and Ron Paul sentiment in the Republican Party, but of course, our own president is, has been, his, his sort of overriding goal in foreign policy is basically to have less of it, to have less of a role for America in the world, um, even if that means basically turning a blind eye to horrific violence and horrific tragedies everywhere. I mean, Syria, of course, is a, the probably the key example of that. Yes, that, that's a very good point, and I agree with you on that. Anyway, uh, Ethan Epstein, I want to thank you so much. Uh, of course, I, you, you write with the Weekly Standard, and that's the, I believe, uh, weeklystandard.com. Are there any that's other uh, websites we can guide you, uh, our listeners to? Uh, you know, I think weeklystandard.com is, uh, they'll find more than enough there, so let them spend the day there. No need to go to any other sites. <laughs> Excellent. Ethan, thank you so much on this busy day for joining us. We really appreciate it. And, of course, we look forward to having you back on the program. Take care. I look forward to it, too. Thanks. All right. Take it easy.